And this time our children are going to be dismissed at um, ages three through third grade. Appreciate those that are working with them. They make their way out. Visual aid this morning. I know you hadn't heard that in a while. <laughs> Visual aid this morning is something that uh, you've probably seen before. Uh, it, it really was popular before electronics came onto the scene. And it is a go-to if electronics fail to work. So you've got to tell me what this is. All right, you ready? What is this? Oh, it's the projector voice, right? With technology, we don't need that. But, you know, uh, I was watching a, a video way back before uh, we had electronics. And this is what the police were using <laughs> to tell people where to go during a situation. And I thought, wow. And then it progressed, and the next scene was them using one that was an electronic one. It was a lot louder, and they were, they were doing decibels. And then they got into the more modern stuff, and it was really loud. Uh, we have gone a long, we have come a long way. So it is something used to talk at people. Now, unless you're really hard of hearing, you don't want one of these to just carry on a conversation with somebody that's right there in the room with you when there's no other distractions. It is used to talk at people. Now, men, this might be hard for you to grasp, but ladies understand it thoroughly. A lot of times when we are supposed to be having conversations, husbands, we are not to be talking at our spouse. We are supposed to be talking with them. We are to be able to talk and listen. It's a give and take. It's an opportunity to understand and take time to listen. It is not just talking. It is not talking at them. It is talking with them. There is a difference. So ladies, if I need to counsel you this week because your husband doesn't understand that. Let me know. This is a good week to do that. We can talk about that. It's important to understand, men, that we need to talk to people, not at them. So if you have your Bibles, we are in the book of, anybody remember, because it's been a few weeks? That's right. First Timothy. As you find First Timothy, you go to chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5. I have to thank Pastor John. Pastor John, as our assistant pastor, has stepped up and did an amazing job the, the, the night that he uh, yeah, Give my hand a clap, please, the Lord. When Brandon got in his wreck and we left and we had to call him up and say, Hey, not only are you doing the Lord's Supper as we had planned, now you've got to do the baptisms and you've got to preach. That's a lot to throw on at 10 o'clock on Saturday night. And uh, from what I heard... That was one of the best messages he ever preached. I was under the impression, just do the baptism and talk about baptism. Let Jack lead the worship. Come back in, do the Lord's Supper and go home. But no, he had to step up and preach. The nerve of a preacher to get up there and preach. But he did a great job. And we are grateful and blessed to have had him and his maturity along the ride with us. Now, if you found the, uh, the first Timothy chapter five, you may remember as we've been covering first Timothy, that it is who is the author? Oh, I thought I was going to trick somebody. That's right. God is the author. What earthly man has God chosen to write through? He's writing through Paul. Paul had been spending a lot of time in prison. He wrote a couple of things that we call the, uh, the prison epistles. He got released from prison. Timothy was there with him. Timothy traveled with him to Ephesus. And while at Ephesus, Paul was going to go on to Macedonia. And Timothy wanted to go with him. And you remember what Paul said to Timothy? No, 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 no. you got to stay here. Now, he was already at a very young age, a pastor of a church. Now he's a little bit older. He, he's still considered a, a young boy at, at, in, in his probably late 20s, early 30s. <laughs> But yet now he's not over one church. He's over all of the churches all over Ephesus. And remember, they had small home churches. So there was a lot of them. And so he was the one that needed to be there because there were some issues. And Paul, in this letter, addresses the issues that Timothy needed to confront what was happening. Now, I want to tell you something. If you tell a pastor, like Pastor John, looking for a church to go to, we would love to have you come to our church and be our pastor. But let's tell you that we've got 10 problems here that you're going to have to address within the first couple months you're here. Not too many pastors are going to say, I'm looking forward to doing that. 
And most of them would say, I don't think so. Others would say, no, only if you're going to pay me enough to deal with those problems. You know, it, it, it's a situation that Timothy found himself to be in, and there was no other option. He had to confront the situation to take place. So in chapter 1, we saw the message of the church. The message of the church has never changed, and it will never change. It is that Jesus, the Son of God, loved us so much, He left the glory of heaven, came to earth, died on, uh, lived His life, died on a cross, rose again, conquering death for us, sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on behalf of you and me. The only way to the Father is through the Son. <laughs> And then when you turn your life over, the power of the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you to live through you. The message of the church has never changed. We found that in chapter 1. Chapter 2 is the members of the church. Chapter 3 was the managers of the church. That would have been, uh, you know, the, the pastor, the assistant pastor, the worship leader. We are the managers of the church. And then we got to the ministers of the church. That would be our deacons, our elders, our uh, Sunday school teachers, our Bible leaders. That, those are the ministers of the church. And then we get into chapter 5. Chapter 5 is the ministry of the church. And we're only going to look at the first three categories today. It's going to be to men. It's going to be to women, and then it's going to be to widows. So if you got your Bibles open to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you again for all that you've done for us. We thank you for a church that is a praying church and the power of prayer is evident. We pray right now that you'd help block out any distractions, help us focus on your word. We pray, Father, that we can see your word come to life in our mind's eye, that we not only can understand it, that we will be willing today to make a commitment to apply it to our life and live it out. Each day this week, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, look at me at verse 1. It says, do not rebuke, that means to speak angrily, at a who? An older man. Now remember, Paul is aged. He's older, and he's writing to Timothy, representing a young pastor, even though he's in his uh, you know late 20s, early 30s, he's still considered a very young pastor, and he's being told how to handle conflict with someone older than him that's a man. He says, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort. In other words, talk to him as you would talk to who? Ah, so young pastor in a, young, in a church, you want to speak to older men who are believers, even when they're in the wrong, even, even though they're doing something you got to correct, you need to do it in such a way as you would do with your own father. Men of the church, this is an encouragement to you when you are young, how you talk to those who are older. Now, we live in a time in a society in America where young people are disrespectful of older people. They think that older people don't have uh, or should not be allowed to continue on this planet. Get rid of them. What good are they? It's because they haven't taken time to sit down and listen to the experiences that they've had. One of the things that me and Paula always found ourselves excited about, when we were even, what, 13, 14, 15 years old, we would always sit with older people and listen to their stories because they had amazing stories. Now, I liked it when they would tell us some things that were really bad. Because I'd say in my mind, make a middle note, don't do that. Don't do that. That had bad consequences. Don't do that. They didn't want to share those stories very often, though. You had to kind of pull them out of them. Older folks have great wisdom, either because they did something they shouldn't have did and the, the consequences of that, or they avoided something that they realized later in life could have been detrimental to them. As young people, sometimes we don't realize that what we do, what we choose today, could affect every day of our life from that day forward. They don't quite get it. You know, a lot of times they think they're invincible, they don't live forever, nothing can stop them, nothing can slow them down, nothing can hurt them until they get hurt. Now, not only do you talk to uh, older men with respect and you exhort them and encourage them, even if you're trying to correct them, but now look at the next part of verse 1. How to treat younger men, they are to treat them as what? As brothers. Now, brothers who care for each other, got each other's back, do things together, enjoy each other's company. Talk about dreams, shoot each other dreams down, whatever it is. They, they play together, they work together, they do things together, they enjoy each other's company. That's what the exhortation is for men in the church. If you're talking with someone younger than you, 
Don't talk down to them because they're younger than you. They look up to you. They respect you. They, will, they might even want to be like you. You might be their hero. You need to treat them as someone you can encourage them. Yes. You need to live Christ out for them to see. That's exactly what he's talking about. Pastor, young pastor, for those that are younger, treat them with respect. Encourage them. Come alongside them. Talk with them. Oftentimes you see me with younger children and I get down on my knees or I get down on their level because I want to see them eye to eye. I don't want them to have to look up. It is because I want them to talk to me. And I'll ask them questions. And it's funny because parents, you do it all the time. I ask them a question. You answer it. <coughs> but I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to them. I want them to answer it. I ask them a question because I want to hear their answer to it. Even if I know the answer. That's how God expects Older men to talk with younger men. Just because you don't like their music, just because you don't like the way they dress, gives you no right to disrespect them. Just because they are not to disrespect you. And the house of God is a house of prayer. It's a family of God who loves the Lord first and foremost as the Father, but Together, we love each other and we should learn from each other. Older folks can learn from younger folks. Younger folks can learn from older folks. And I just saw that this week because an older man could not figure something out on his phone and turn to a, 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 a not a perfectly stranger, but a young boy and said, hey, can you fix this? And fixed it within seconds. See, value in everyone if you're looking for it. Don't do like the world and devalue people based on preconceived ideas of them. Now look at verse 2. We're going to change gears. Now we're going to talk about, not only we're talking about older men and younger men, now how to treat older who? Oh, and you're supposed to treat them like what? A uh, mother. So, young pastor John, if you get called to a church or you go to a church, whatever, you, you've experienced it here. You've got older women that are going to treat you like a kid or like a son. Like, I don't know if you realize that, but you do that. Older women almost always Treat younger, even pastors, as they would their, their sons. They would invest in It's that motherly instinct you can't get rid of. It's just who you are. It's how God created you. And we are to be okay with that. So, young boys, if some other church folks come up to you and they mother you, be okay with it. That means they care about you. Even if they're correcting you. Even if they're giving you advice you don't want. <laughs> Respect them. So, here, older, older women, treat them as you would your mother. Now, what's the next group of people? Younger women, treat them as what? All right, now, we're getting in a little, little uh, area here that needs to be echoed over and over and over. This is not just for young Timothy as a young pastor, but it is for all men of all ages to take to heart what is being told. Because if you learned it as a young man and you lived it out throughout your life as uh, to an old man, you understand it. Look what it says now. It says older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with all what? Now with all purity can go to the mothers as well as to, or the older ladies as mothers, as well as younger as sisters. Now, brothers should desire to protect sisters, step up for them, intercede on behalf of them, that kind of stuff. Well, in the church, we are to treat women with purity. That means protect them. That means we don't put ourselves in a position to do things that would break their heart. Not just sexually, because there is a sexual element to this, but as a man, we are to respect them and we are to teach them what to expect from other men. It is the responsibility of the family, the church family, men in the church to show the respect to women so that when they're outside of the church, they don't expect anything less. Now, I'll tell you, we live in a society working with teenagers for 18 years that men, guys, teenage boys want to do everything they can to control the, the, the female population. And it's heartbreaking. They want to demean them. They want to put them in their place. They want them to do what they want as a, as a guy, not what they want to do as a girl. That should not be what it's like. We as men, especially men of faith, men of God, should do everything we can to protect 
their reputation, their image, who they are. We are to step forward to assist them. We are to be the one that they can trust. And young pastor, don't use your position of authority in an abusive way. We have seen that taking place in our newspapers. We need to be above reproach. Look at the next section in, in verse 3. Now we're moving on to the next group of people. Honor who? The widows that are really widows. Now, I don't know about you, but as a pastor, I'm reading that, I find it very comical. Honor widows as really, those who are really widows. I'm like, what in the world? You're either a widow or you're not. It's not a if or and. You can't be a, a, a fake widow. You, you either are or you're not, right? Uh, so this is what it's talking about. Honor widows who are really widows. That means take care of the widows who really need help. Widows are those who ha have a family to support them. Really widows, circle that, really widows are those who do not have a family to support them. Honor is the command to show respect, demonstrating one's attitude and their actions. And it speaks financially, spiritually, it speaks physically of encouragement. That's what we are to do. God never intended the government, folks. God never intended the government to step in and take care of widows. The problem was the church wasn't doing it. Now, you flash back to Acts. That's what Jonathan preaching through Acts. You flash back to Acts. After Pentecost, you got the apostles studying the word of God, preaching the word of God. You got them set aside seven men that we call what? Deacons, they're servants, that's right. And he, and he had them set aside because there were widows being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And so the, the apostles said, we ain't got time to serve tables. We've got to stay focused on the word, preach the word, and evangelize the lost. Therefore, we need men who are, and they enlist what their qualifications had to be, and we need them to serve the tables, to serve the church, to help the people, making sure the widows get the food they need. This is what Paul's going back to. The church was responsible for taking care of those who were widows who had no one else to help them. Now, women, let me tell you something. In our day and time, when you become a widow, it's a little bit different. In that time, you become a widow, you had no one and nothing to support you. You didn't have a way to make a living. Therefore, to be an older woman and then to be left without a man to support or a child to support them, or at the mercies of whatever or whoever would come along. Heartbreaking way to live your last years out. God said through his word, men of the church, the church were to gather up the resources to help them. And when the church did not do it, our government has stepped in in America. They have stepped in because the churches either didn't have the capacity to be able to help out or they were being neglected still. It continues on, look at verse 4. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them, the grandchildren or children, let the widow of them learn first to show what? Piety at home. That word piety means respect. It means reverence. It means obligation. It means to show devotion to God by taking care of their own family and to repay their parents for this is good and acceptable before who? God says it's good and it's acceptable that the children and the grandchildren step up to take care of the mom who has no husband left, the widow. Honoring our parents. You might remember the fifth commandment. You know the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment of the commandments says to honor your father and mother. You know, the first five, uh, first four dealt with our relation with God. And then the fifth one dealt with our relation in our home, how we need to honor the, the parents. We need to love them. We need to be there, respect them. And then the last five of the commandments deal with how we re re interact with everybody else. And then Jesus, when he was challenged, saying, what's the greatest commandment? And he said to what? Love God with all of your heart. And then the second is like unto it. Love others. <coughs> and in that you'll fulfill the, the ten commandments. Here, it's, it's a reference back to honoring our parents, including taking care of them physically and financially as they grow older. In effect, we are returning time and energy they gave us while we were young. You're like, oh, but I don't want to spoon feed my dad his cereal. Well, he spoon, spoon fed you when you was a baby. He probably didn't like doing that. I don't want to change them adult diapers. Well, he didn't want to change them diapers. Neither. See what it does? It's a give and take. Now, see... Parents who have not raised their children right, who have raised children who don't like their parents, who don't want nothing to do with their parents, 
who hate their parents, they're probably not going to step up and take care of you, which is heartbreaking. See, you love them, and you support them, you discipline them, you correct them, you be there for them, and then you let them fight over who's going to take care of them. See, that's the way you do it. I got no doubt. If something were to happen to everybody in the family, Jenna and Brandon and Addison, they go all have to figure out who's going to take care of dad. They can fight over it. That's the way we, we, you are to raise our kids. By that time, Jayla might be big enough. McKenna may be big enough. They're like, oh, we'll take care of them. Whatever. Somebody going to take care of them. Not the government. Here, it's a direct instruction for children to give back to their parents because their parents have given to them. In verse 5. Now, she who is a really a widow, that's the one that has no one to support, and left alone, she does what? She has no choice. She is back into a corner. She has to display that she is trusting God. She's trusting God for the next bite of food she has. She's trusting God. That's the hope and confidence in God. And it continues to, in, in supplication and prayers at night, that means she's praying throughout the night and she's praying throughout the day. A widow who's really in need of help is going to be praying. You know, it's amazing when you compare people who have everything they ever want in life and you compare people that have a little bit of nothing and you compare the spiritual people that love Jesus, come to church, worship church. You know who prays more? Those over here that are poor, that don't have much of anything. They spend more time praying because they have nothing. They're relying on God to help support them, bring them that next meal, provide that next whatever. Oh, here we've got everything. You know, we just pray a token prayer, or we just give a prayer of gratitude that we got it. You know, but theirs are a little more earnest because when you have not, you learn to trust Him more. When you're weak, that's when you find out how strong He is through you. But you have to be weak. You have to be at that point. You have to be in that position of need to see Him come. To your aid. Look at verse 6. It says, But she who lives in pleasure, I mean, she uses her life to please herself. This is a reference to living ungodly life focused on her own desires. But she who lives in pleasure, this is talking about a widow, is dead while she's what? Yes. See, the people outside the church, they're like, What the world does that mean? She can't be dead if she's walking around. You can't get a mom dead dead. They don't realize that if you are walking around without Jesus, you're walking around dead. Spiritually, you don't have him, you don't know him, you don't love him, and you don't have him working in through you. So you're a walking dead person. One of my favorite songs in the whole world by uh, used to be the lead singer Petra named John Slip. He came out with a song that was talking about Wake the Dead. That's the most energetic song that I, I know of. It makes me pumped up. It makes me want to go evangelize people. <laughs> it makes me want to share Christ with them. It makes me want to look at them a little different than they're walking around dead, and it's our job to wake them up. You know, when your kids got to get up for school and you go into the bedroom, you, you wake them up until they get up. And in my house, if you don't get woke up and you don't get up, then we go get an ice cold water gun and wet you down to get you up. We're going to get you up. We should have that same determination on the people who don't know Jesus. Because if they don't wake up, they'll spend an eternity separated from God. It's our responsibility to love them enough. To get out of our comfort zone and to try our best to wake them up. The women who's a, a, a widow, who's living for herself, living in pleasure, separated from God, not associated with the church, is on her own, living her, what we call, if you're young, sowing your wild oats, going after everything that feels good, looks good, tastes good. You don't care about anybody else except yourself. We live in a world that there are a lot of people living lonely lives. Lonely lives. Wishing they had somebody to do things with, go places with, even maybe drink coffee or fellowship with. Now I'm telling you, if you are in this church and you are active in this church, our church does things for our widows. There are things available. We got time to go out to lunch with other women. We got our deacons who annually take our widows out to show them we care about you. And that you got a deacon assigned to you. If you need something, they are the ones you call and say, hey, you know what? I need this. Our deacons are servants and they will figure out how we can help you get that. We have enough widows that amongst yourself you can get together so that because I hear it all the time, folks, all the time. I'm lonely. Nobody to talk to. Nobody to hang out with. Nothing to do. Well, you know, think back to when you was a teenager. 
when you was a teenager and you had nobody to hang out with, nothing to do, you figured out where other teenagers went and you went there. Oftentimes it was probably not a place you should have went, but you, we do that. As an older person, a widow, without even, it's your responsibility to look for other people you can connect with. So I have tried my best to connect widows with widows, saying, hey, you know how they feel. It takes a widow to know how another widow feels, and then it takes a, a widow to be able to come alongside another widow to say, hey, I'm praying for you because I know what you're going through. And then you develop a prayer community. We need that, and I'm glad that we do have that. And you, if you're a widow, you can take advantage of that. Look at verse 7. And these things command that they may be blameless. Now, in other words, tell the believer they are uh, there to take care of all their family so that no one can say that they were doing something wrong. Um, it's a reputation. Look at verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, huh, huh, huh. You remember me talking earlier about the kids that might not like their parents and might not take care of their parents? Not well, God's got a word for you too. So if you're listening, you ain't taking care of your parents because you don't, didn't like them. What does God say? Look at verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, that's all his own family, and especially for those of his household, he has done what? Denied what? The faith. The faith. In other words, Jesus told you what to do, and you say, I don't think so, Jesus. I'm not going to do that. That's living in disobedience. You cannot be without sin, blameless before God, if you're living in disobedience. That's why we say if you've given your heart to Jesus and you ain't been baptized yet, you need to get baptized. Baptism doesn't save you. It's an outward expression of an inward change, but it's being obedient because baptism helps you to identify with Jesus who was baptized to identify with he, you or his followers. Taking care of our own is vitally important. If anyone does not provide for his own, especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than what? Oh, oh, oh. Everyone should take care of their own people, their own family, those that they uh, grew up with. If they do not do that, then they do not uh, accept what they believe. It would have been worse for them. Remember, we, we looked at uh, Paul's writing, God writing through Paul, and a teacher has a the utmost responsibility to teach truth. And God says that a teacher will be held in more accountability than the student. Those who don't take care of their family, it would have been better if they had not even been a believer because they're not living out their faith. It's sort of like saying, I love God and I love everyone, but I don't like them people over there because they don't make very much money and they smell really bad. And I don't like these people over here because they have a different culture than me and I don't like that. I don't like these people. See, that's not love. <laughs> Love is, I love people because they're created in the image of God and they need God. We need to show the world that by sharing the world or him with the world. Your responsibility, my responsibility. You have people in your family, you have people in your community, you have people around you, you have people in, in the places you go that need to know Jesus and let me tell you, the older we are, the older you are, the older the people are you hang out with, the less time they got. Now, we know that you can die at any age, but when you're 80 and 90 years old, you're really close. You know, you can't say you're not closer. You are closer. You know, like that 104-year-old woman skydiving. You know, you got a bucket list of stuff you want to do. Be careful. I would encourage every believer who loves Jesus, who goes out to Jesus, who reads the word, who focuses on fellowship in the church, I would challenge all of you to figure out somebody, one person a week you can talk to about Jesus. Just one person a week. But you know what? In one year, that's how many encounters? 52 people who have the opportunity for their life to be changed. Now, I said to myself, whenever I decided that God was leading me to do that exercise to evangelize thing, that I was going to share Jesus with one person a week. And then one person a week became one person, no, two people a week. Then three people a week. Then every time I go to the gym, all I can see is lost people dying and going to hell. So maybe two people a day, three people a day, four people. A day. Where does it stop? Jesus would never let it stop. 
Jesus says, as you go, everything you do, everything you are part of, should reveal to everyone who you love, who you go after. I think the problem is we've got people in America who ain't going after God, so they don't share Him. we got people that attend church. That's all they do. That's their whole religious experience. And God doesn't want us involved in religion. He wants us involved in a relationship. So that you get up in the morning, you can't wait to talk to him. You go throughout the day looking for people you can share him with. And, and, and I'll tell you, if you make a commitment, say, I'm going to share Jesus with one person every single week this next year. You make that commitment. You go and you share with one person and they treat you poorly, say bad things to you, you call me up. I've been there. I've had people say all kinds of mean and hateful things. And I'll help you get through it. Because the enemy will try to destroy you by le- letting a liar share lies with you that God doesn't see in you. But remember, their father is Satan, and he's the father of all lies. And it, he's going to tell them lies to help pacify their need for the Lord. But he doesn't excuse you, he doesn't excuse me from sharing Jesus with them. If not you, who? can only be someone who knows Jesus. They can share Jesus. Just like it, it, it takes a widow to know a widow, it takes a Christian who had been lost to share Jesus with another lost person. And don't come to me after the service and say, well, Pastor, I don't even hang around with nobody who's lost. That's not true. That's not true. Because you went to the grocery store. There's lost people there. I don't usually use that as a target because to me, if I'm even getting groceries, I don't want you bothering me with anything. You know, uh, it, It's tough when you live in a, a, a large community. Like we, we went to a large church down in Florida and, and if you went to the Walmart that was right by that church, you saw people that didn't come to church that morning, but you, you see other people that want to talk about the sermon, they want to talk about this, they want to talk about that. You know, an hour later, just going in and getting bread and milk, and I can't get out of there. You know? so, um, it, it has its advantages sometimes You know, driving 30 miles away to go to the grocery store. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's about your reputation. But what do people see in you when they look at you? Have you thought about that? We care. I mean, you can go on Facebook and see people care what people think of them, which is so ridiculous. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what anybody else thinks of me. I don't care what people that I've never even met me think of me. I don't care. I do care what God thinks of me. I do. I really do. I let him down a lot. But he picks me up and says, let's try again. You prayed for me last weekend on the motorcycle ride. Somebody did pray because I crashed once. Somebody, somebody, one of y'all fell in your prayer. I, I should have missed that rock, but I didn't hit it and went round down. Got up, got it going. On. The guy was talking to my phone, Denny, never even knew I went down. You know, it was no big deal. Didn't let go of the handlebars. But see, I got right back up and got going. That's the way it is with our Christian walk. If we share Jesus and somebody's mean and hateful to us, that's okay. Get back up. Dust yourself off. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Now look at the other side. You share Jesus with one person a week. 52 encounters. Statistics say that a couple of them are going to give their heart to Jesus. Maybe not the moment you share Jesus with them. But you may just be planting the seed. Somebody else is going to water the seed. God's going to give the increase. And you know what's really cool? I know every time I reach out to somebody at the gym who's already a believer and we have a great time. I was faithful. And God may not allow me to sow any, uh, uh, to reap anything here, but he's going to allow us to reap something over here. Someone we didn't sow. It's all about faithfulness. When we're faithful to God, he's going to be faithful to us. Amen. We need you. You need to be reaching out to people. Not just me. All I can do is tell you to do it. I can't make you do it. I can hold your hand if you want somebody to go with you because you got somebody you really want to share Jesus with, but don't expect me to do any of the talking. I'll do the praying. I'll go with you. I can give some hints on some things you can do, say, whatever. But you've got to do it. If God lays it upon your heart, somebody, then it's your responsibility for him. It's just honoring him. The worst thing is they say, leave me alone, I hate you, I don't want anything to do with you. Okay, no problem. It ain't like they're going to pull a gun and shoot you. And if they do, you're going to heaven, so it don't matter. <laughs> Make sure you're right before you go and share Jesus with somebody, right? Paul is telling the church how to treat men. Older and younger, how to treat women, older and younger, and he spends a lot of time on how to treat widows. We'll continue with widows next week, and then we'll find out he's going to tell us how to treat pastors. 
<laughs> that some of you didn't even know that was in the Bible. And then me and John had to read it and make sure we match up with this. How I treat him, how he treats me, how you treat us. Yeah, it's very important. It's your responsibility for God to live out his life before him. Look at the last bit here in verse 9. Do not let the widows under how old? Now, I, this is kind of ironic. Don't let the widows under 60 years old be taken into a number and not unless she has been a wife of only one man. Um, you, you know what the lifespan was back then? Usually around 62, 63, 65. <laughs> so you say, hey, if they're almost dead, take care of them. <coughs> take care of them. Look at verse 10. Uh, I'm going to read 9 and 10 together again. Do not let the widow under 60 years old be taken into a number, and not unless she has been uh, a wife of one man. Well reported for what? Good work. She should be known by the good she has done. Look at her reputation, what she's earned. If she has brought up children, that's her reputation inside of her home first, as a mother. If she has lodged strangers, that means she's welcomed travelers into her home, people who are traveling from one church to the next. Her reputation is outside of the home. If she has washed the saints' feet, that's serving the needs of God's people, her reputation within the church family. If she has relieved the afflicted, helped those in trouble. If she has diligently followed every good work. In other words, used her life as all kinds of good her reputation recognized by all people. So God hit every point right here. Every single point of a widow's life. All of her life. What's he going to say to do with her? Well, that's next week. Some of you will read ahead. Some of you will not. We are not to talk at people. We are to talk with people. But folks, you want to know how to really talk with other believers? You need to know Jesus. If you're here today you've never invited Jesus in your heart, you're watching through Facebook Live or you're listening at a later date and you've never invited Jesus in your heart, it's not by accident you're here. It's not by coincidence that you're watching. It's because God wanted you to hear to understand that it is the responsibility of the church to love Him and to love others. And this is what it looks like to minister to those in the church. If you're not in a church, God wants you to be part of a church. If you're here today, God wants to work in and through you. But it's all about a relationship with Him. We've done the ABCs of salvation for a long time. I'm going to see if you still remember. What's A? Amen. Admit that you're a sinner and condemned unclean. Everyone can admit that you've done something wrong. B, what's B? you got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Let the glory of heaven came to earth, walked in our shoes, was tempted by everything and yet remained without sin, died on a cross, rose again, sits at the right hand of the Father. If you believe that, then what's C? Confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart unto salvation. But we've been really going down the Roman road, remember? Romans 1, 16 says, I'm not ashamed of what? I am not ashamed of the gospel. You want to reach one person or share Jesus with one person a week for a, a whole year? You, it's because you're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. And you know that Romans 3, 23 tells us that who have sinned? Everyone has sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. We are born into this sinful nature. But... Romans 6, 23 tells us that the gift of God, the, uh, the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Payment for sin. Payment for re rejecting God. Is eternal separation from God and death. But the gift of God for you, for me, is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And if you confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart unto salvation, it's your choice. What will you do with Him this morning? We're going to have a hymn of invitation. I invite you to come forward. I invite you to Send us a message on Facebook or give us a call. Say, I want to invite Jesus to my heart. You can do it right now by saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Live through me. Something simple. Remember, he's looking at your heart. He's not looking at the words you're saying. He wants you to say them because there's something about confessing him with your mouth. Power in our words. It's your heart he's looking at. If you're by your head, close your eyes. Father, we do pray that you speak to our hearts this morning. Those that are here, we pray that you encourage them. If there's any here today who do not know you as their personal Savior, never invited you to their heart. If something said that they would have spoken to their heart, that they would know they need you to have that everlasting life. We pray that you'd help them to come forward, take me by hand, say, Brother Kenny, I want to invite Jesus into my heart. Now, maybe they're here and they've invited Jesus into their heart, but they haven't been baptized by immersion. They want to identify with Jesus. It, 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 it encourage them to come forward and tell me. And we'll set it up to have another baptismal service. We thank you for what you're doing in and through the life of those that are here. We pray blessings upon them right now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Standing as we